way people see this ability is different than how it's experienced. I would rather walk and all that, but at the same time, it's like I feel like I value life a lot more than other people. That's not normal, ordinary people and then disabled people. Actually, that's just people. Thirty to forty percent of our body consists of muscles. They help us walk, write, lift, dance, and live. Imagine the muscles working less and less, and finally not working at all. This is what happens with muscular dystrophy. The most common form is called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Duchenne is not contagious. It is a condition you are born with and is caused by a change in a person's DNA, resulting in a deficiency or lack of dystrophin, which is an essential protein for the muscles. It leads to progressive deterioration of muscle tissue, which turns into fat and scar tissue. It is a disease from all countries and races all over the world. It affects about one in every 3,500 boys. Girls can also be born with Duchenne, but this is very rare. Due to improved medical care, life expectancy has extended enormously. Average life expectancy was 19 years in 1990. Currently, this is 30 years. Timely recognition of Duchenne and its accompanying and known problems is key to successful and early interventions. In addition, scientists are constantly working to develop experimental treatments that influence the change in DNA within Duchenne. The muscle weakness manifests itself between the age of 18 months and 3 years, while diagnosis itself is usually made between the age of 4 and 6 years. Between the age of 6 to 10 years, the muscle power decreases progressively. The boy will fall down more often, not being able to get up on his own. At the age of 14, most boys use a wheelchair full time. During this time, also, arm and hand function declines. This has an enormous consequence for self-help and make the patient more and more dependent on others. Up until the age of 18, there are further increases in muscle weakness, resulting in life-threatening heart and respiration problems. The men use respiratory support, or a tracheotomy tube, to help with breathing. There also may be brain involvement due to lack of dystrophin, however this is not progressive. While all have an increased chance of learning problems, only 30% suffer from intellectual impairment. Reading difficulties occur in 40%. Attention and emotional problems are also more common. There is no such thing as an average boy or man with Duchenne. Each boy or man is unique with his own strength and weaknesses. They can live a normal, independent future and develop their own competencies and with appropriate support can play a full part in society. This documentary is an effort to understand how young men with Duchenne cope with their illness and its consequences how they manage stress and maintain a quality of life. About what parents can do and how professionals can contribute best. But above all, this documentary is about the key to successfully living an adult life with Duchenne. Meet Robin and Oliver from Belgium. Thomas, Peter, and Mohammed from the USA. Peter from Denmark. And Eustace from the Netherlands. I'm 20 years old and I study here in Delft. I study industrial design. And this is where I live with my uh, roommates. Maybe people would think, oh, going all the way from Amsterdam to Delft and living there and going to uh, universities, maybe, maybe you shouldn't do it because it's too hard or something. And I always thought, oh, that's part of doing... I mean, if I had, wouldn't have had Duchenne, I would do, probably go to university as well. Going from elementary school to high school and from high school to university, it's always a big step because it's really different. But I think, yeah, for everybody, for everyone, if you're in the wheelchair or not, like for everyone, that's, that's a big change. You know, 
Poland you have the personal bound budget so you can hire people to help you so you don't have to do it through a big agency you can just for example hire those students or just pay them uh, for what they do so then you can just decide who you like uh, to come that's what I have with all my helpers that they're uh, also my friends it's not just you can think oh now that one is coming just to do his, his thing like like it's only business the older students who are not my roommates they do all the getting me dressed and taking a shower and my roommates they do all the things like yeah making tea making dinner just all the things they would do for themselves but then they do it for me as well <laughs> It's always important to have good facilities, like here in, in Delft with the faculty, like they immediately made a sign with my uh, number plate for my car and they'd even done things I'd, I hadn't asked for yet. So I think that's the only part which makes it really different than other people's life, that, you, that it's harder. You can't just step on your bike and go somewhere. So for that, the car is really easy. And, you, of course, can't live in every house if there would be a lot of stairs in, like, in the average student uh, dorm or something. It would be difficult. This is my room. Okay. And with my own bathroom in it. So this is like a hotel room. Shower, toilet. Yeah. Everything your man needs to get ready in the morning to go to school or to go out in the evening. That's right. Yeah. This is the kitchen and living room. Pots, pans, and booze. We start the day in the kitchen, and then we, after everything, college or the, yeah, study things. Right. We all the stresses of life. Yeah. All the hard stuff. Yeah. Then we uh, go here to relax and watch television. A good student location. Yeah. Well, plenty of room for partying, uh, studying. Studying. My full name is Patrick Motion. I live in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. I'm 38 years old and I have Becker muscular dystrophy. I am a full-time uh, music teacher. I think living independently at any time in your life is very big because you learn a lot about yourself and not having mom and dad around to help you plan everything that you're doing. My parents told me at a very early age that life will put up its own barriers, don't put up any more of my own. So right away I was set on a course of a, of a positive attitude, and I think that has made a world of difference. So I, with the positive attitude and support system of many, many people, I decided to do whatever I wanted to do. But you have to go out and create those positive moments. They're not going to happen if you're sitting around at your house or if you're feeling sorry for what has happened. I never thought like I was going to fail because they instilled in me that do what you want to do. You have to be happy with your job and your career. You don't want to get out of bed every day and hate your life, just yeah. like everybody else. I just do it sitting down. I think we think of Duchenne muscular dystrophy in terms of boys. And we keep referring to Duchenne muscular dystrophy as affecting boys. And we have failed to make the transition to the fact that these boys become young men and adult men and capable of their own ideas, their own dreams, their own thoughts. You can see it in all the books from just 20 years ago and some of the books still are telling that you can't be more than 20 years when you have Duchenne. And I think still a lot of people don't realize they really get get older because we know, we know from the data that the average man now lives till 30, but people still speak about it like it's a pediatric disease and some boys live, live into adulthood. I think what's missing in the transition process is first the assurance that the boys are going to grow up. So physicians creating the environment to suggest that the boys will grow up from day one of the diagnosis. What I see is sometimes that uh, at 18 people think, oop, Oops, he's still there, and what should we do now? And then a program has been made. So I think the most important thing is to start at a young age to see what ingredients and skills are needed to have this uh, uh, normal life and to think about living independent or to 
uh, to live with friends or whatever. Ik denk dat dat eigenlijk het, het, het moeilijke is, omdat effectief uh, juist op het ogenblik dat andere kinderen, andere adolescenten eigenlijk hun weg gaan, deze jongens eigenlijk een toenemende nood hebben aan, 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 aan hulp en steun van de omgeving. The parents um, are so focused on the security that they're not preparing much for, for the independence. And, um, and my advice would, would be to, to allow to allow some failures, to allow some suboptimal. My name is Peter, I'm 29 years old and I live here in Fredericksburg. I've been working for some years with the handicap policy in organizations and I got a, an BA in Danish literature and I like to watch art and so on. It's a myth that people with disabilities always got a bad life because they're human beings and of course they can think about their own life as well as other people. My parents uh, helped me a lot because they didn't uh, talk to me like a disabled person. I moved away from my parents quite early in my life and that, that made me a stronger person, I think. It made me uh, more independent. Uh, and I think that that's important to do early, actually, in, in your life when you when you got a, a disability like Duchenne. I would like others to see me like, like a real person and not a disabled person. Uh, I would like to uh, be in social networks where, where they're not looking at my wheelchair all the time, but looking at Peter uh, and uh, appreciating Peter as a person. So that's, that's very important for me, that's, that the disability is not uh, an important factor. It's not uh, something I think is an identity. It's something uh, that, that, that you live despite of. There's a lot of prejudices and myths in our culture that you have to fight. And before that, yeah, if you don't succeed in that fight, it can be very difficult to, to, to get another role in society than the disabled one. Uh, yeah, so I think it's uh, there's work to be done in, in many levels. some things that I would say that I was able to accomplish. One is being able to work full time. Um, I got my master's degree in social work. I think getting married and having a daughter is sort of a very different kind of, uh, I don't know if you can call it an accomplishment. Well, I guess I thought of sort of two possibilities for the future when I was younger. Um, one was that uh, muscular dystrophy would be cured by the time I was in college or by the time I graduated college. It kind of kept me going to think that. And, um, but when I thought about the idea of going through the rest of my life with Duchenne, it was hard for me to imagine that I would find someone who would want to take all that on by marrying me. And um, I'm still sort of surprised by it sometimes. But um, I guess you never know. <laughs> yeah. 
the idea of having a baby was, um, it was a, definitely a struggle to make that decision because I think it's very hard to, to lose a parent at a young age. But Jessica and I thought long and hard about it, and it was something that we both wanted. You know, we thought it's going to be hard, but we'll figure it out. Helen is six months old now, almost seven, and um, seems pretty happy and well-adjusted. So it's working out well so far. I would describe the new generation of, of young men and adults with Duchenne muscular dystrophy as, as a, a, a um, thoughtful generation that wears different glasses, has different approaches from what we know, different thoughts, and, and essentially have their own thoughts. I find some young men in the con confines of their environment are a little reluctant to express themselves. So I think this new generation, in my opinion, will be very expressive, will take control of their lives, and will pave their own way forward. I think the new generation of Duchenne boys, there are more and more boys and men who are prepared to have a longer life. So there are more ambitious young men now. There are men who record their own guitar CDs and sell it, you know, there are people who start their own business. This generation uh, is a generation who have learned us about uh, how to be adult with, with, with Duchenne. So, uh, and that's good for the next generation because then we can tell them how is it to be adult with Duchenne. They're asking for more from their society and their uh, physicians and I think that that will allow them to, to do more, to have even a richer uh, life than their predecessors had. and I'm 20, about to be 26. I live here in New York and I'm a graduate student. So my focus is in uh, philosophy, theology, the Bible. I'm sort of all over the place. I always went to mainstream schools. That was my parents' decision. They wanted to sort of give us as close to a mainstream education. And I'm very glad that I had that experience. I have many good friends who really understand my disability. It doesn't matter if you're standing up or sitting down. You can have a very full, active life and participate and you know, do all the, the good things you can and also get into trouble on your own too, uh, which I did my share of as well. Not being able to walk or not being able to do things, it, it sometimes doesn't register as a loss in the same way that it might for someone else. Um, but I'm glad, in a sense, that I held on to things because it enabled me to keep my, my body working well for longer, which is, which is great. Um, and sort of just eases that transition, you know, when you realize that when something takes you, for example, when it takes you 20 minutes to put your shirt on, you might start realizing that you need to ask for help uh, with the muscular dystrophy. You have to uh, say goodbye to different abilities, uh, and that's just a part of life. And it becomes natural, you know, just as when, when someone becomes elderly, they lose abilities. Uh, and in our case, it happens much earlier, and you become accustomed to it. Just as, I guess, old people are accustomed to being old, uh, so it becomes natural, it becomes normal. My name is uh, Mohammed Hader. I'm a 
third year student at the University of Pennsylvania, um, studying international relations and economics. Most of my friends, they call me Mo. And in high school, I had one physics teacher, and he kept saying, I gotta get you a license plate for that wheelchair. And he had these silly puns like momentum or other physics jokes, and I was like, no, no, just get more money. I've heard a lot of people say to me that they see that, and then they're like, you know, they were having a bad day or something, and they saw that, and they said, what am I upset about? This guy has a joke on the back of his chair, and I'm upset over nothing. I think that's a nice thing to add something to your wheelchair. I like driving the chair fast around campus. I guess some of the worst days are when the wheelchair is giving me trouble because then either you can't go or the battery didn't charge or something. And then even on a campus like this, a lot of places are not handicap accessible. And when I was younger, I had a hard time asking people for help. That's the one thing that took me a while to learn. But once, now I don't mind asking people for help because you learn to, uh, you realize you need help, so you had to ask. I mean, I feel like my life, even though I have this disease, has not been that much more challenging than anyone else's life in the sense that, I mean, some, everybody has some kind of problem or maybe they don't, but they know someone with the problem or, you know, so it's, and a lot of times you don't know other people have that and you think, oh, I'm alone and I'm the only one, but yeah, I guess that's another challenge to overcome is to realize that you're not alone in whatever problem you have. Because you think when I was younger, I used to think, why is it me? Why am I like this? But then I guess once you start seeing other people and think they have problems too, that, helps a lot. Some of the success factors I found in my life is that when I was, you know, my parents and my brothers and sisters, they never treated me like there was something wrong with me. They just treated me like I was anybody else. You know, they were just as rough or nice as they would if I was walking, you know, mm -hmm. or if I had no problem. Yeah, and my parents, you know, if they were getting yelled at, I got yelled at just as much as my brothers. I wasn't any special. So I think that's good because at least you're not consciously thinking about that maybe you're different or anything. I guess another thing I would say is to, you gotta learn to be determined to get what you want. Because if you don't fight for it, nothing will happen. Starting at a young age to live a normal life, that's one of the main success factors in living a, a normal life later on. Um, you see sometimes that children at a young age already are kind of pushed in the, in the field of handicapped children, which is really very difficult for them if you go to a school for handicapped children and with all the professional helpers, and then you're 18 and you're supposed to enter the normal world and you never have tried to survive. In, I mean, normal life is a jungle, isn't it, <laughs> for all of us? But I think for young boys, if they are just get used to help, ask for help to friends, to other people, know where are the risks, what are the hurdles. It's important that, that they can be so, that persons with, uh, with Duchenne can be so independent as possible, that they can live uh, uh, in the way they like to live. And then there is a, a burden on, on the child to go out there and take some risks and, and fail sometimes. And that is socially that uh, a young man may ask a, a girl out and, and she'll say no. Um, and, um, but then he may ask someone else out and she may say yes. And it, it, there may be failures uh, academically. There may be applying to schools he doesn't get into. Um, but that's, that's part of the, the human experience that um, some boys are shielded from. But so many families spend their whole life lives holding their breath for something to change dramatically that life returns to the normal life or the life they imagined so I think the success factor is to look at life as precious and to enjoy every day and and to hope for the best and certainly have a therapeutic dose of hope but to also recognize that time is short and and you must make the most of it Ik ben Olivier en ik ben 20 jaar en ik woon hier in Antwerpen. De week ben ik hier, ben ik met mijn vrienden.
Voor mij is het een leuke dag. S morgens naar school gaan en s namiddags hockey spelen. En s'avonds gewoon gezelschapsspelletjes spelen. Of, en dan soms dat ik ook eens op de computer kan en alles. Dat ik me gewoon kan amuseren. Zonder iemand dat zegt dat mag wel, dat mag, dat moet niet. Gewoon doen waar je zin in hebt. Nou, dat is voor mij een goede dag. Nu ben ik nog mobiel, maar binnen enkele jaren, ik weet het niet. Dus ik misschien in, al in een rolstoel, voltijds. Ja, dat is niet zo gemakkelijk. Maar het is hier wel een goed leerproces om te zien hoe zij alles doen. Dan kan ik me al vroeg bereiden wat er gaat komen. Wat om mij later te wachten staan. Ik ben 30 jaar en woon in Antwerpen. Dat zou wel willen werken. De eerste leeftijd van 18 tot 30 jaar kunnen we perfect op de computer iets doen. Dus uiteindelijk zou dat wel goed zijn, maar op het moment dat je zo één zak zegt van we gaan werken, dan, ja, dan kunnen er meer terug op inkomen. Daarom dat is de zaak te groot om dat te doen. Maar ik zou dat wel willen doen. Ik zou wel willen verder studeren. Want ik deed eigenlijk heel graag wiskunde. En dan uiteindelijk krijg je niet de kans om dat verder te doen. Omdat het gewoon er niet op voorzien is. Dat is wel spijtig. Dus moet het moet aangepast zijn dat we ook richtingen kunnen kiezen. Die ons ook liggen. En dat we dan ook voor eigenlijk een beroep of een richting kunnen kiezen. Dat het eigenlijk zover komt dat er begeleiding mee kan. Naar het gewoon onderwijs, naar een gewone school. En dat die je dan helpen bij hetgeen dat je nodig hebt. Hetgeen dat ik wel zo is, dat er vooral zijn veranderen. Gasten die problemen hebben, die helpen proberen te helpen. Dat ja. Hetgeen dat je moet proberen is, is eigenlijk je leven zin te geven. Hè. Ik maak zo ook websites en zo. Dus... Ik weet mij gewoon wel nuttig te houden, dat is goed. Losing the ability to walk, that's, that's a major moment. Maybe the most difficult adjustment. But beyond that, once you're in a chair, if you can't, you know, lift weights with your legs, it's not the end of the world. I find you get very used to your body being in one state because it, the progression is so slow that things sort of creep up on you. It's a little negative even to me, you know. When I stopped using the coffles and had to use the chair all the time. Because it just feels like you lost something, but at the same time, at least I can go wherever I need to. And sometimes you get this doubt, like, oh, I should have kept going. You know, if I kept going, I would have still had it. But you realize when something becomes difficult that, okay, I can let it go. It is sometimes frustrating. Another thing is that you'll be going along, you know, no problem. And then people look behind, they see you when they get out of the way, and you're like, I'm just going through. I'm not going that fast. You can stay there. Because there are children of a lot of age more questions than for what they mean. They'll come up to me and ask, what's wrong with your legs? Or, you know, what happened to you? And there was a young child that came to us and said, van ja. Zijn jullie echt? The way people see disability is different than how it's experienced, um, certainly. So, I mean, if every morning I woke up um, and realized, wait, I can't move, maybe I'd freak out if I wasn't used to it from the former day. I sometimes try to defy expectations. I don't like to be pigeonholed or people to assume that I'm a certain way because I'm disabled. I hope they just look at me the same as anyone else, only they see, yeah, of course you see you're in a wheelchair, but I hope they don't, I feel different. In my friends' kring is al bijna zo, want er zijn heel veel mensen waar ik in het weekend naartoe ga, 
slita en zeggen van nou kom we gaan samen niet drinken. Ik vind dan vader van ja, kan ik er binnen dat hij dan zegt van nou eigenlijk weet ik het niet. Dus die zijn er eigenlijk al met mee bezig. I think there's lots of changes that need to be taken, taking place in current care and treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I think first and foremost has to be that we promote success in the boys from the day of diagnosis. That we ensure or assure them that they are going to have long lives and productive lives. Children could be included from a younger age also in the management of their own care. If you explain to them why things are important, um, have them included in discussions that might help to Look after yourself when you're older. De zorg is zeer duidelijk de laatste tien jaar verbeterd. Ik denk het coördineren van de zorg, het op elkaar afstemmen van de medische aspecten, zoals cardiaal, respiratoire, orthopedisch, heeft, betekent echt een, een heel grote vooruitgang voor de, voor de zorg van deze uh, jongens en uh, jonge mannen. Voor jonge children is very often now that's really improving. Um, a day where you come and see all the physicians together, multidisciplined care, etc. What I see in my son is now he's getting older, it falls apart because you go to a separate cardiologist, you go to a separate pulmonologist. So all the things which are de developed in care for the younger children uh, don't exist for the older ones. Advanced planning is, is critical. So to not wait until age 18, for example, and say, oh, boom, we have to find a new team, to start assembling that team early. If I could rule the world, that I would make sure that everyone has access to optimal care, to the mobility devices and breathing devices that are necessary, and also to the access to treatments. There should be a bottom line standard of care that's acceptable, and that doesn't exist yet. Um, so the professionals could take away the fact that continue to educate the patient and the family that you can have a, a long, positive life and you can do a lot of great things. When I'm at the doctor, I usually want to know why they're doing what they're doing too, not just that they're doing it. Also, if you're small, it's nice if the doctors that, yeah, include you into what they talk about. Maybe they don't have to explain it that difficult that they are the same way they explain it to your parents, but not that you only talk to your parents and you just sit there and think, oh, but they're talking about me. I've learned through meeting other people at Parent Project and other events that some of the kids have different problems than I do, even though the same age and everything, but so I guess it's a more diverse set than doctors sometimes realize. I'm glad that they have a life that they don't have to do. But respect and begrip. We also can live quite well, not moving around much. Um, but the heart and the lungs are key, and a lot of focus needs to be put there. At night, I use a, uh, a BiPAP ventilator, uh, which I really need to, to sleep comfortably. It uh, enables me to take deep breaths and basically not feel constricted during, during sleep. So here we go. It's very noisy. When I visit all adults with Duchenne, and one of the questions there was, who are your best friends? And all of them said that it's my ventilator. I find it a whole other uh, population than, for example, our children with other neuromuscular diseases, for example, spinal spira atrophy or other things. They have a really different psychological profile. And I think it's the ventilator because they know that if they don't have the ventilator, then they couldn't live. And the next question we was asking them, who, who is the, the best friend after the ventilator? Then it was the wheelchair. And I think that's because that gives them independence. People with Duchenne muscular dystrophy want to live. They 
they in general are happy people. They in general are not depressed people. Waar dat we in, in de sfeer van de ILS regelmatig toch wel geconfronteerd worden met uh, mensen die eigenlijk naar actieve of, of, of toch naar euthanasie vragen, is dat iets dat ik persoonlijk in de groep van de jonge mannen met de ziekte van Duchenne nog, nog nooit ben tegengekomen. Zij hebben mij zelfs ook al um, ac, uh, ja, echt verwoord van wij willen niet in de palliatieve zorg geplaatst worden. Want dit is geen palliatie. Wij willen gewoon het leven dat wij nu hebben zo mooi en zo goed mogelijk uh, leven. You never should say you can't do this because you have Duchenne. I think that's one of the important things that if a boy wants to do something of has plans, you just make it work. One way or another, maybe in a different version, but never say you can't do this because you have Duchenne, because I think you can do a lot when you have Duchenne. The surprises are what what can they do? So I'm surprised when an 18-year-old comes in and says, my hobby is to play the piano. And you know, that wouldn't have that wouldn't have crossed my mind. It's important for me to achieve some things, like, uh, for example, I write some poems, uh, and I would like to, to uh, be better at that and uh, maybe perform it to an audience. I'd say for a lot of high school and maybe a little of college, I thought that I was going to be a rock star when I grew up. Um, for some reason, I don't know where I got this idea, but. Um, I just really enjoyed singing. I think traveling is really fun. Yeah, I always like that because then you, yeah, you always see new things. I've always dreamed of going to Germany since I studied the language as an undergraduate. Um, and so there I was. We were up north in uh, the island of Rügen, and I was there with my father and someone who was helping me. And that's it. It was just the three of us. And as soon as I saw you know, the ocean right there. And you know, I said to myself, I have to, I have to swim here. I can't really sing so much anymore, but um, I do play around with trying to um, make music on the computer. All of a sudden, we hear this screaming voice, and it's a lifeguard yelling at us in German. Because think about what she sees, these two men dragging this pale, lifeless body out of the water on a raft. I mean, you know, God knows where he found this guy. Like, you know, she might be thinking all kinds of things. So she comes running. She's yelling in German. My dad is like, Tommy, you better talk to her because I don't know what she's saying, but she looks pissed. We went on a world trip, so really a trip around the world. First to London and from there to San Francisco and Los Angeles. And we also went to Hawaii, New Zealand, and to Japan. So finally, they sit me up. And she's just looking confused. And I look at her and I just say, Wir sind verrückte Amerikaner. We're just crazy Americans. Um, and that's, that, that was enough for her, I guess. She uh, was like, OK, and, and left. And they got me in my chair. Um, Actually, at that moment, the raft popped. After its ordeal, I just couldn't take it. So it popped, and we just started laughing, because the whole thing was just hilarious. Sometimes it's quite absurd what happens, and then you have to laugh in the end, because sometimes it's just very comic. If you can kind of look at yourself not as sort of a tragic story, but maybe as, as a comedy. Humor is very important when you have to cope with difficult circumstances. Being depressed all the time definitely doesn't work. My friends make all these jokes about handicap and wheelchair, and I, I enjoy it too. I laugh as much as they do. For example, uh, I was talking to somebody, and they were like, about lifting, and they said, oh, well, you know, if you drop them, it's no problem, they're paralyzed. I mean, it wasn't referring to me, but making a general joke. It's paralyzed, won't feel the pain anyway. Well, you know, that's... I don't take offense at those kind of things. The muscular dystrophy sometimes can be to an advantage. Uh, years ago in the United States, there was an American Express advertising campaign. And when you flash the American Express card, the slogan was, membership has its privileges. I use that sentence a lot with muscular dystrophy. Uh, around the holiday time, I get really nice parking right outside the stores. My friend said, you park so close. I said, well, membership has its privileges. You know, sometimes if I go to Disney World, things like that, I don't have to wait in line. You don't have to wait in line? No, membership has its privileges.
Good morning. I am feeling well and enjoying my day being filmed for a documentary, period. I hope that this documentary will be useful for others to learn about living with a disability, period. Go to sleep. Very important is the technology that I rely on. So obviously my computer allows me to, to read, to write, to communicate. So basically I just move the mouse around with my mouth. When I want to click, it's a sip and puff. So I just blow on it just very softly and it clicks. And if I breathe in, it does a right click. It can also type in Morse code. So if I breathe in for a second, it'll beep. And then I can actually use Morse code to type. In the knowledge that with assistive technology, you can overcome a lot that you wouldn't have been able to overcome 30 years ago. Uh, there's a lot that, that one can do. And that knowledge gives hope. With my joystick, which is hidden under here in the blankets, I can uh, I can use my joystick as a mouse on the computer. Of course, I'm also active on Facebook, and I can do this myself as well. If I want to read some news on the internet, or it could be anything. I'd say that most of the time, it's fairly easy not to think about having to show. Um, as long as you are doing things, as long as you're sort of too busy to notice it. Having a career, having a job, it helps self-esteem and self-worth so much. Uh, you're going somewhere every day, you're making a difference in the community, you're doing something, uh, doing you know anything that you want to do that you love. I've been studying for some years and uh, I had a clear ambition at that time to become a, a to have a master in something. Now I got a, a bachelor's degree and maybe that's a start. I mean, another thing I want to accomplish is just to live as long as I can and have the best quality of life that I can. The physical therapist said, do you feel that you're extra ambitious because you have this disease and you feel like maybe you won't have as much time as everyone or you feel like you have to rush to get things done? And I never really stopped to think, think about that before, but I think she's kind of right. You know, I don't ever want to sit back and say that I let an opportunity go by uh, later on when maybe I won't be able to travel as much as I am now or something else. I don't want to look back and say, I should have done that. You know, but then again, I don't feel like that's necessarily muscular dystrophy. I think for a positive attitude, that's some way that we all should live. So here's the place, we have a kitchen right in here. So and then here we have the main room, which is also, also my room. I have my bookshelves, my desk. This is the room where the guy who helps me lives. Uh, and in my bathroom. This is where I live, and as you can see over here, I got my kitchen. And uh, this is my helper, Nikolai. He has a room in here. This is where I sleep, in here. And I got my bathroom in here. And this chair I use when I need a bath. And then uh, I eat my dinner here with my helper. So this is where I live. Having your own individual helper is very important. If you really need health care and personal care, then it's important that you don't use another person's helper, that you have your own helper all the time. I have four different assistants right now. I have one person who just does Tuesday and Thursday evenings after I get home from work. And I have Brandon who's here today who does the weekends. It sets my mind at ease. I don't have to worry about being left in a jam uh, because I know that I have help. I have someone who's sort of looking after me, which is very assuring, very helpful. Um, and he accompanies me uh, to class to drop me off there and pick me up when it's over, brings me the lectures. Without them, I, well, I guess my life would be very different. I think it's important that you can live by yourself, have my own rules. 
in my own house. The individual flex flexible help is the first step towards an equal life. Of course, when you get in a new social network, maybe people got some prejudice. But I think the places I've been, at least, people quickly find out that, that I'm Peter and I'm not a disabled thing in the corner. But, but of course, some disabled people and some uh, with the Shen, of course, have more challenges. And maybe it's not that, that open and not that social-minded as I am. Our relationships between friends and romantic relationships are also very important. I mean. As human beings, everybody's looking for respect and acceptance and love, and it's the, it's the same. Maybe you don't think, uh, see yourself as a sexually act attractive person, or maybe an attractive person uh, at all. Uh, and that's a challenge you have to overcome. When relationships begin and they get going, the question always comes up, you know, what can you do, what, can, what, what is gonna happen in the future? Um, some people have become more worried than others, but you just, you, you know, you say, well, you, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. I mean, it's, there's, no, there's no guarantees on anything. So if we're going to date and have a relationship, then let's see what happens one day at a time, just like every other relationship. And if things get extremely difficult, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> Ja, da klikket det direkte på et nivå, da kom han ned til deg, eller? Men da er det jo bare å gjøre kvinnene enda nå. Efter tre år ble med etter samme god vondt. Men etter enda ikke så spett nok på hvilke dager da kom det. Da sa jeg klart ikke om dere fortalte som har. Han får det med etter så har jeg ikke. People that I have dated, and people that have been in my life romantically, that other friends have said, you know, wow, just, you know, busting around my chops, saying, well, she's really pretty, how did... How'd that happen to you? I said, I don't know. Maybe she feels bad. I don't care. She's dating me. That's all that matters. I have a three year old And my mother was saying that I was feeling more aandacht than me. She had to give it to me. my brother. And I was very happy to have a for parents, it might be more difficult to watch your child go through all these different stages of progressive chronic illness. But for the person that's actually living it, we don't think about it maybe every day. Like I was saying about the switch from walking to a wheelchair, you might want to delay it as long as you can, but it might not help the kid if you delay it because they might want to move around and you're restricting them from that. You don't def always have to, to be there with your son because, I mean, like going to school and so on, I, I think it's better if like a helper or someone could bring you than if you do everything with your parents. Be open and honest with your kids. And also, I would say don't treat your children like fine porcelain or china that could break. Everybody, including us with muscular dystrophy, we need to go outside and we need to feel what it's like to skin our knee. And when we're kids, we need to feel what it's like to fall down. And I understand the bone issues and I understand the muscle issues, but you gotta, we have to get out there and, and live. And you have to understand that maybe it won't be easy for us to ride a bike, but there's something else we can do. Um, keeping the kid in the house just playing video games isn't gonna teach them about life. They're going to grow up, they're going to become adults, they're going to be, they're gonna be mature, and they need to realize that life is difficult. And the, more equipped you are to deal with it, the more tools that you have in your toolbox, the better you're gonna be at dealing with everything else in life. Forget muscular dystrophy. My advice to parents of a young child with a new diagnosis would be to try to find a middle ground for them to live. Not low that there is no hope and certainly not high that there is magic, a magic wand available tomorrow, but some sort of middle ground where there is realistic hope and appreciation of the time that they have now and that they will have in the future and making sure that all of them, every member of the family, is productive and engaged in life. A lot of 
parents still feel that they are the only ones who can care. And if you do that long enough, enough, indeed, you are the only one who can care. But also, yeah, you have to take risks. And I think one of the best things which has happened when we can give the, the Duchenne man free so he can be independent of living is that we also uh, uh, give the family free. They can let their, uh, they can let, let their boy be a man. And they can see that, that now it is just like it is with other boys, other girls. I would go back to that, that difficulty of wanting to provide security and, and wanting to, um, to keep your son from suffering to allowing him to achieve independence. And that is um, something that I think all parents uh, struggle with, but is particularly difficult for parents with uh, children with chronic illness. you think uh, you want to do. I like going to university, but maybe, I mean, it's not that everybody should do that if you think, I just don't want to do that. Yeah, it's also fine, but it's not that you shouldn't do it because you think, ah, oh, it's too hard or, or something like that, or too difficult to get it all organized. No. I think you should just uh, try it. Meet some people you can rely on and trust, you know, otherwise trying to do it alone is somewhat tough, you know? Something is better than nothing. But having, being involved in some way is better than being left out. Try, keep trying things, because I mean, a lot of times you might think you're not capable of something, but if you try it, you know, it's, it's a good experience and you learn something. Optimistic way of, of life is important because if there's th things you can't do, you have to focus on the things you can do. Even in the face of difficulty, adversity, there is, you know, great reason to live and love and enjoy the world and to be, to have humor and joy. And those are available for everyone. I think Duchenne men should be treated as adults responsible for themselves, their care, for their own independence, and for their own productivity and happiness. Well, too much is focused on that they're just handicapped children and not prepared for a future. And I think that's still happening in most centers in the world where people already at the moment of diagnosis, they say, take him home and love him. Well, if, if people would have told my parents, don't expect anything from her at the age of two or three, I would have had a different life. When we measured the, the, the quality of life uh, for the Duchenne adults, uh, actually it was better than it was for, uh, for the same group if you compare it with the average group. I have actually a unbelievable bewondering for the families that I have to now known. I have actually schitterend, schitterend families uh, uh, and I have to know them. And I am also very grateful for them. I think that we, as professionals, learn more daily from the elders and from the young men themselves. I think this is an extraordinary group of uh, young men and um, you know I have I have difficulty thinking about them without becoming emotional um, they have taught me so much and um, as a as a society um, we need to um, do more for them at every level of society. And the amount of um, resources that we have invested in them is minuscule compared to what we need to overcome. This, this is equivalent, if, if not even more difficult, than getting a man to the moon. And we need to invest the, those same type of resources for them. They deserve it. Having Duchenne has a large impact on everyday living, but as shown, living an adult life with Duchenne is possible. Looking at these different stories from all over the world, we can sum up several success factors. 
social and physical support leads to independence. Setting goals and reaching them in inventive ways. Daily activities give satisfaction, acceptance, coping, and optimism. Access to good medical and psychosocial information. Continuity of care during the transition to adulthood. All of which contribute in achieving a good quality of life. I actually think I, I got a very good life with a lot of uh, opportunities despite my disability. Uh, but my life is not perfect. I don't think you can find a life who is perfect. I'm independent. I'm you know, happy and I have you know, friends. I do what I want to do. I mean, I really don't feel that I'm held back. It's the same things that that anyone wants. And that, I think, is to, um, to be loved and to be with people you love. If I have to make a grade, it would be an eight, I think. I mean, I'd have to give it a 10. I would say 10 now. Nine or eight and a half or something. Yeah, of course, you have moments that, that you think, ah, you know that everything isn't that good, but it always goes away again, so. I mean, I hate to say it, because I would rather walk and all that, but at the same time, it's like, I feel like I value life a lot more than other people. A lot of other people just, sometimes I get angry, too, when I see people throwing away opportunities and chances, and I'm like, if you knew what life was worth, I mean, I guess the shorter time span makes you consider with higher value. You know that you can do more than things you can Gewoon naar kunnen klein dingen zijn waar andere mensen gewoon niet naar kijken. Zo. So, een voorbeeld, mensen zien dansen. Ja, ik kan ervan genieten van dat gewoon te zien. Dat is heel raar. If you have the right attitude and the right support, you can do anything that you want to do. I just happen to be sitting down. It doesn't, other than that, it doesn't matter. And when people say, well, what about 10, 15, 20 years down the line when things might be a lot more difficult for you. I say, well, I'll worry about that in 10, 15 to 20 years, you know, because right now it's 2011, and the scientists and researchers watching this in 20 years, we're going to be working on something else because muscular dystrophy will be all done. That is my hope, sure. I mean, you got to have that. Without hope, there's nothing. So I keep that positive hope every day.